You're in high school. Try to remember the feeling. The hallways are packed with other students. Some you know, most you don't. You only have a few minutes between classes, but you always make time to meet up by the lockers. It takes you a second, but then you finally see her. You squeeze in a few minutes, chatting about your first period and how that boy you're crushing on didn't come to school today. Luckily, you both have the same lunch block, so you'll fill her in then on how you heard he broke up with his girlfriend and how this might just be your chance. A quick hug and you're rushing off to English. You never say it out loud, and maybe it's only ever a fleeting thought, but man, you're glad you have her. You could not survive high school without her. You imagine many more years of friendship ahead of you as you both navigate the highs and lows of high school. You can't imagine growing closer than you already are, but you do. You sleep over at each other's houses, you keep each other's secrets. Eventually, it's like your sisters and it feels like nothing and no one can come between you. This was how 16-year-old Skylar Nees felt about her best friend, Sheila. Sheila was a girl Skylar had known since second grade, a girl she trusted and always thought that she could count on. But there's a saying about betrayal. The saddest thing about it is that it never comes from your enemies. Welcome to the podcast that reminds you it isn't the boogeyman you should be worried about. It's the stranger you know. In October 2020, Skylar Neese was a freshman at University High School in Morgantown, West Virginia, where she attended high school with her longtime friend, Sheila Eddy. The girls had known each other since they were eight years old, and high school only seemed to strengthen their bond. In Skylar's home, Sheila was like a member of Skylar's family. She was always welcome, without question or invitation, and Skylar's parents treated her like one of their own kids. Their friendship was solid, and it was a bond that didn't seem to get shaken by the addition of a new friend, Rachel Schof. Rachel came from a religious upbringing, and she liked acting and school plays. She was personable and hard to miss, with long red hair and blue eyes. And for some reason, Rachel and Sheila clicked and became fast friends. I feel like a lot of us have been in this scenario before. The one where your best friend finds another best friend, and suddenly three is a crowd. In the best case scenario, it isn't a problem because everyone gets along. In the worst case scenario, someone is pushed out from the friendship circle. But by all appearances, Skylar was in the best case scenario. She seemed to get along well with Rachel, which may actually speak more to her character than anything else, because Skylar was kind. She was a good girl, who worked hard in school, got excellent grades, and cared about others. So it isn't hard to imagine that she would embrace Sheila's friendship with Rachel instead of letting it create a divide between them. So before long, Sheila and Skylar's duo became a trio, and the girls became inseparable. Classmates recall seeing them together constantly. You wouldn't see one without the other two. And the girls' social media pages were filled with selfies together, posing in mirrors, dancing, doing all the typical things teenage girls do. But as is usually the case with social media, all was not as it seemed. While the girls appeared to be as close to one another as ever, Sheila and Rachel seemed to be forming a connection that didn't always include Skylar. Skylar's Twitter around this time paints a picture of trouble in their clique. In one tweet, she writes, Too bad my friends are having lives without me. And while her tweets never name Sheila or Rachel directly, they seem to express an ever-increasing frustration with feeling left out and a growing distrust of her closest friends. For most of us, our teenage years are plagued with drama, especially if you're a teenage girl. I'm lucky enough to have grown up without social media, Seriously, I do feel bad for teenagers today. But if I had, 
I'm sure my Twitter would have been filled with passive-aggressive tweets and teen angst over disagreements with friends. But still, reading Skylar's tweets, it's hard to tell how much of what she was feeling was that typical teenage drama over small fights between friends that are quickly forgiven and forgotten. Or Skylar expressing that feeling you get when someone you love starts turning their back on you and you can't figure out why or what you did wrong. For weeks, the tension between the girls grew as Sheila and Rachel began to distance themselves from Skylar. And if Skylar thought Rachel was to blame, she wasn't wrong. Rachel idolized Sheila and she wanted her to herself. So she did nothing to help repair Sheila and Skylar's strained friendship. In a scene that sounds like it was straight out of the movie Mean Girls, one classmate recalls witnessing Rachel laughing as she secretly listened in on a telephone call between Sheila and Skylar arguing. And yet, Skylar, Sheila, and Rachel never stopped being best friends. The truth is, Skylar probably felt like toughing it out with her friends was better than losing them completely, because when do you quit on a friendship? At what point should you listen to that nagging thought in the back of your mind telling you something isn't right? For Skylar, it was hard to walk away from her friendship with Sheila because it was built on years of memories and so she didn't. On the night of July 5th, 2012, Skylar retweeted, All I do is hope. A tweet that in retrospect reads as blind optimism by a girl that hoped things with her best friends would take a turn for the better. It would be the last tweet she ever posted. That night, after telling her parents goodnight, Skylar snuck out of her bedroom window, a little after midnight. Surveillance cameras on Skylar's apartment complex would later show her walking and getting into a car around 12.30 a.m. Her parents were none the wiser until the next morning, when Skylar's dad Dave realized Skylar wasn't in her bed. His first thought was that Skylar had snuck out, and like any parent who finds out their kid broke the rules, he was angry. Of course, he called Sheila, hoping Skylar was at her house. But initially, Sheila told him she hadn't seen Skylar, and she had no idea where she was. Alarm bells went off for Skylar's parents when Skylar didn't show up for her shift at her part-time job at Wendy's. Skylar had always taken her job seriously, and she wouldn't just not show up. So they called the police. When the police arrived, they initially thought Skylar was probably a runaway. They arrived to find a missing window screen and a small bench under Skylar's bedroom window that was put there to help her get in and out. And so they concluded she had left on her own and would likely return on her own. But anyone who knew Skylar knew she wouldn't just run away. She was a responsible teenager And there weren't any signs that she was unhappy at home. Most telling, she hadn't taken anything with her. None of her clothes was missing. None of her personal items were taken. And what should be a sure sign for a teenage girl that she had every intention of returning, she had left her phone charger. So no, her family and friends knew, in their gut, that if she left her home in the middle of the night, it must have been to meet up with someone. Their suspicions were confirmed when Sheila later called Skylar's mom and confessed that she and Rachel had in fact picked up Skylar the night before. She told her they had gone joyriding around town, and eventually they dropped Skylar off back at home where they had left Skylar at the end of the street to avoid waking her parents. But Sheila's admission gave her parents little reassurance because it didn't answer the single most pressing question. Where was Skylar now? Skylar's parents were left wondering if something had happened to Skylar while she walked back home. Or did she make plans to meet up with someone else? Rumors swirled at Skylar's high school and around town over what could have happened to her, including one rumor that Skylar had gone to a house party that night and overdosed. It was a rumor Skylar's parents found hard to hear, but one the police themselves considered as possible. Weeks passed with no sign of Skylar anywhere, and efforts to find her were widespread. Her family put up missing posters all over town, and Sheila, who seemed distressed over Skylar being missing, 
would often visit Skylar's parents to assist them and to comfort them. Yet, suspicion over Sheila and Rachel's role in Skylar's disappearance slowly grew amongst their classmates and the police. In an interview with 2020, Jessica Colbank, a detective working the case, recalls how Sheila's demeanor during her first interview with police raised some red flags. She described her as blank on emotions and iced over. Not a good look. Detective Colbank also recalls how nervous Rachel seemed. But most concerning was the fact that Sheila and Rachel's story of what had happened that night was exactly the same, which led investigators to believe that it was rehearsed. As they continued their efforts to find Skylar, police realized that some parts of Sheila and Rachel's story just didn't align with evidence of their movements that night. Like the convenience store footage that recorded Sheila's car heading west to a different town instead of east, like they had said. And the cell phone pings from Sheila and Rachel's phones putting them in a different location than where they said they had been. Those who grew to believe that Sheila and Rachel had to know something more about where Skylar went that night began to put pressure on the girls to just tell investigators what they knew. But they kept insisting they knew nothing. Even after they changed their story once again to admit they had driven to a different town than what they originally told investigators, they were adamant. They had returned Skylar home. So police were left to piece together the inconsistencies in their stories themselves in hopes they could figure out what had actually happened. But then police get the break they need when they receive a call from Rachel's mom asking for help. In the 911 call, you can hear Rachel screaming in the background in what can only be described as the throes of a mental breakdown. Her screams drown out her mother's voice, and you can hear her father trying his best to restrain her. That day, Rachel is taken to a mental health facility, and after she's discharged, she asks to meet with investigators. It was then, and only after her conscience demanded it, that she finally shared what really happened to Skylar. Rachel tells police that after coaxing Skylar to sneak out of her house that night, they drove miles to a different town, where they parked Sheila's car in a desolate, forested area. They got out of the car together, smoked some pot, and they just talked. When they turned back to walk towards the car, Rachel said she counted to three, and suddenly both she and Sheila began to stab Skylar in the back with knives they had managed to hide from Skylar's view. And while Skylar did try to put up a fight, she was no match for the two girls, who had caught her off guard and defenseless. When they were done taking her life, Sheila and Rachel covered Skylar's body with branches and twigs, and then they just drove away. Now you might think this is the part where police arrest Rachel and then race to Sheila's house to take her in too, but that's not what happened. Instead, investigators decided to use Rachel to try to help build a case against Sheila, who was still standing firm on their joyriding story. So with that, they let Rachel go free, but they used the information she gave them in her confession to recover Skylar's body. They instruct Rachel to encourage Sheila to talk about the crime while she's wearing a microphone, but Sheila doesn't bite. On social media, Sheila plays the role of a grieving friend, posting messages to Skylar and expressing her disbelief over her death. And meanwhile, the police continue to watch her and wait. But Sheila showed no signs of guilt, despite the fact that she was keeping the secret of what she and Rachel had done. What's worse, there may have even been a part of her that reveled in that secret. One day, she tweets, we really did go on three. A tweet that only made sense to her and to Rachel, and unbeknownst to Sheila, the investigators. When the police finally moved forward with arresting Rachel and Sheila for Skylar's murder, the news still came as a shock to everyone, even though there was a large group of people who had already suspected they had known more than what they were saying. The police had suspected the girls were covering for something, 
But like one detective tells 2020, they never encountered anything in their investigation that led them to believe they had conspired with one another to commit premeditated murder. But that's exactly what the girls had done. Rachel confessed to investigators that she and Sheila had plotted to kill Skylar for months before that night, a plot that began in science class at school. They had even prepared for it by placing a shovel and cleaning supplies in the trunk of Sheila's car earlier in the day before they met with Skylar that night. Both girls were charged as adults, and both pled guilty to the charges. Rachel was sentenced to 30 years, while Sheila was sentenced to life in prison, with the possibility of parole in 15. Only one of the girls, Rachel, chose to speak during her sentencing hearing, and she used the opportunity to apologize to the niece family for what she had done. I'm so sorry. I don't know if there's a proper way to make this apology, because there are not even words to describe the guilt and remorse that I feel each day for what I've done. The person that did that was not the real me. Not the person I am, not what I'm made of, and not what I believe in. I don't think I ever thought this would actually happen. I became scared and caught up in something that I did not want to do. I never realized the gravity of my actions and how many people I've hurt. I hurt the niece family and those who love Skylar. I hurt my parents and shamed my family. I hurt my extended family and all of my friends who loved me. I hurt my teachers and those who believed in me. I hurt my church family, my community, and those who trusted me. And I hurt my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May God bring eternal peace to Skylar and the entire niece family. Again, I'm so sorry, and I pray each day for everyone involved, and I pray each day for forgiveness. It was an apology Skylar's parents could not bring themselves to accept. I think the lawyer wrote it, she just read it. Yeah, it was, it's not heartfelt. She doesn't, she's not sorry what she did, or she wouldn't have done it. Sheila, on the other hand, said nothing, and has never said anything, about what happened that night. And while Rachel and Sheila pass year after year in prison serving their time, the question that continues to be asked by everyone involved is, why did they do it? When she was asked by investigators, Rachel said she and Sheila just didn't like Skylar anymore. At Rachel's sentencing hearing, the prosecuting attorney, Marsha Ashdown, offered the state's version of motive for the crime, telling the court that Skylar knew Rachel and Sheila's secrets and had gotten in the way of their friendship. But it's hard to believe that anyone would think murder is the best solution for a friendship that's just run its course. If that were the case, there'd be a lot more murder amongst teenagers in high school. So it's a haunting question, the why of this. Even more haunting is that Skylar asked the same thing in her last breaths. Why would her best friends, one of which was a girl she had known since she was eight years old, betray her in the cruelest, most violent way? And while Mary and Dave Nees continue to try to make sense of it all, they have taken steps to honor Skylar's memory in the best way they know how. They helped to pass Skylar's law in West Virginia, which now requires that an Amber Alert be issued for all missing children, regardless of whether they're believed to be runaways. They also converted the site of Skylar's murder into a memorial. In an ABC News article, her father's quoted as saying, Something horrible happened here. But I wanted to take the horrible thing that happened here and try to turn it into something good a place that people can come and remember Skylar and remember the good little girl that she was, and not the little beast that they treated her like. That's all for this episode. Thank you for listening, and if you like the podcast, be sure to review and subscribe and share it with your friends. Also, follow the podcast on Instagram at the Stranger You Know podcast. And if you have a story of betrayal by someone you thought you knew who turned out to be a stranger, Email it to the stranger you know podcast at gmail.com and I'll share it on a future episode. Until then, trust no one. <laughs>